Okay. Otherwise, um, I can I can wait a couple minutes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm I just started the recording, so Bruce, whenever okay. you're ready, and I'm sure people will continue to <laughs> come All in. Right. I'll let them in. <laughs> so, welcome to those who are here. Um, nice uh, small group for some uh, hearty discussion. Um, <clears throat> today's presenter is uh, AJ Srikanth. He is, uh, he's a doctoral student who is, uh, who is just past the dissertation proposal hearing stage in his dissertation and has started the process of developing a, a three-part dissertation where his explorations around issues of <clears throat> existing state policies for providing programs and services to English language learners which also then includes whatever kind of legal backdrop um, and framing and rights are available um, to support those programs and services. And he will also be down the line engaging in a deeper empirical analysis of uh, well, what really are the costs of providing adequate services to English language learners and how close or far um, from meeting those cost objectives are existing policy structures in, in states. Um, AJ's been with us for a few years at Rutgers. Um, during part of that time, he was also working as a data an analyst within the Newark public school system. And prior to uh, coming to us, he was working as an ESL teacher. And then subsequently as a data analyst within Chicago public schools. But AJ does hail from New Jersey. So he's back home. You're, uh, Born and uh, well, at least raised in in, uh, in Bergen County, if if I'm uh, not wrong on that. Um, All right. So we, he's a he's a Jersey guy who came back to us from Chicago to uh, do his doctoral studies, um, and AJ has played a played a really important role on a number of projects that we've uh, developed through uh, Rutgers Graduate School of Education on external grant funding in particular, um, the development of the School Finance Indicators Database, um, which was funded by the William T. Grant Foundation. AJ was uh, one of the researchers who helped develop the, the data sets that are underlying the School Finance Indicators Database, which has served to inform a number of studies that have been done by authors across the country. Um, and for anyone who's interested in school finance, you know, information data down to the district level across all districts in the country from 93, like 1993 to 2018, um, that's available. And AJ was one of the critical players in uh, helping move this forward. One recent study that actually, even before I move on to that, um, he is also now lead author of a, of a chapter for, it's the Oxford Handbook on US Education Law. He's lead author of the chapter, which explains how, you know, all the crazy ways in which we choose to fund schools across our 50 different state systems in the United States. And he's also author of this, um, a co-author of this uh, paper, article, um, which just came out last month, um, time flies, um, came out last month, which looks very specifically at school funding resource disparities facing school districts serving uh, Latinx children, um, which has a significant overlay then with, you know, what are the resources available for providing um, programs and services for English language learners. Um, so he's been engaged as a doctoral student in the development of data and in the use of those data to explore these issues. And, and today, I believe he's going to present to you more a backdrop on the, on the policy framing, the, the legal um, rights frameworks for understanding the rights of English language learners and the extent of variation in how states, you know, and how well states approach those issues. Um, with that, I would like to turn things over, unshare my screen and turn things over to uh, AJ Srikanth, who uh, will start sharing his screen and uh, give you a walkthrough, a uh, nice kind of small group for some robust discussion. And I will go quiet now. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for that thorough introduction. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background about how I developed this interest. Um, throughout reading um, the policy literature in education policy, one gap I noticed is that there was no connection between school finance literature and um, 
education for high needs population literature. There was a lot on effective programs for English language learners and for students with disabilities, but very little on funding those programs. So the goal of my research is to make a connection between the two where we know that certain programs in certain contexts can be more effective than others, but we don't know one, what is the actual cost of implementing those programs or two, what are state funding systems for providing those programs and how do we provide adequate funding? So throughout my time at Rutgers, my uh, focus in my courses and in my independent research has been trying to bridge the gap between these two fields. So a little bit of an overview. So this presentation will begin with some history and background for English language learners, specifically the legal background. So laws, federal court cases. Next, I'll discuss policies for the identification, assessment, and reclassification of English language learners. And I conclude with policies for funding ELLs um, at the state level, along with a brief descriptive data analysis of the relationship between ELL um, concentration and funding levels. So brief background. So according to the National Center for Education Statistics, ELLs represent about 10% of public school enrollments at the moment. There are approximately 5 million students identified as ELLs, English language learners. And the reason this population matters is because there's a large test score gap and opportunity gap between ELLs and non ELLs. So as measured in scale score points, according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, you can see there are large and widening gaps between ELLs and non ELLs in both reading and in math. There are also opportunity gaps with access to qualified teachers a national shortage of teachers in bilingual programs, lower graduation rates for ELLs than non-ELLs, and so on and so forth. All of this is to say that state funding systems need to be designed to meet the needs of English language learners because of these outcome gaps. I'm going to address the way that we frame this outcome gap a little bit later in the presentation, just because we've chosen a specific set of outcomes to measure our outcome disparities. But it's always possible that if you chose a different set of outcomes, you would have different results. So brief descriptive data from the Common Core of Data. Um, not surprisingly, the states with the largest both absolute number of ELLs and concentration of ELLs are California and Texas. About 40% of ELLs are in those two states. Um, According to the Common Core of Data, um, other states with significant ELL concentrations include Nevada, New Mexico, Florida, Alaska, Colorado, Illinois, Washington. New Jersey has about 6% of their public school population identified as English language learners. But as I will discuss the processes for identifying ELLs and recognizing who they are is different across states. So the most common languages for ELLs, unsurprisingly, Spanish is about three quarters of ELLs are Spanish speakers, but there's significant variation across districts. Take, for example, in New Jersey, there are a few districts where the dominant language could be Polish or Hindi or Gujarati. So a lot of it has to do with demographic variation. So next, I'm going to get into the historical background for ELLs, beginning with um, one of the most seminal cases for ELLs, Lau versus Nichols in 1974. So Lau versus Nichols pertains to a group of Chinese American students with limited fluency in English. They filed a lawsuit against the San Francisco school district alleging violations of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which alleges discrimination based on national origin. The majority of these students did not receive any additional supports for courses for learning English and access to other courses. This denied them the fundamental right for a basic education. The Supreme Court did not find a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, but they did find a violation of Title VI. Here is a famous quote from Lau versus Nichols. 
there is no equality of treatment merely by providing students with the same facilities, textbooks, teachers, and curriculum. Imposition of a requirement that before a child can effectively participate in the educational program, he must have already required those basic skills is to make a mockery of public education. We know that those who do not understand English are certain to find their classroom experiences wholly incomprehensible and in no way meaningful. So that quote is critical because Lau versus Nichols is kind of the case that serves as like a seminal point in history for English language learners that districts and states still refer to when asserting the rights of ELLs. After the ruling in Lau versus Nichols, um, that led to the passage of the Equal Educational Opportunities Act of 1974, which prohibited states from denying equal educational opportunity to an individual on account of his or her national origin. So EEOA in, in, sense, in essence made ELLs a protected group at the federal level, not dissimilar to what the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act did for um, students in special education. Um, this also led to the establishment of a set of the Lao remedies, which uh, provided guidance to states and districts on the identification and placement of ELLs um, issued by the US Department of Education at the time. So the first real test of EEOA and um, Lau, the ruling in Lao, Lao versus Nichols was uh, 1981 at the Fifth Federal Circuit Court. Um, Castaneda versus Picard, which concerned the Raymondsville, Texas to di uh, school district, um, a group of Mexican American students who alleged violations of EOA. They alleged that the district discriminated against them by failing to provide adequate bilingual education programs. So specifically non-qualified teachers, large class sizes, inadequate curriculum and materials. The most critical um, finding an establishment which came out of Castaneda was this three-pronged test for testing the efficacy of programs for ELLs. The three-pronged test from Castaneda was, first, the program has to be based on sound educational theory. Second, um, the program must be reasonably implemented. And third, after a period of time, after that program was implemented, if it was still deemed ineffective, then the district would have to reevaluate and reassess that program and perhaps pursue another program. So the court found violations of the second criteria, underqualified staff, lack of negative, native language assessments. We'll see in a court case in recent history in 2017 that did apply this three-pronged test and um, district guidance on programs for ELLs typically applies the three-pronged test in deciding how to provide programs for English language learners. So, Concerning the funding of programs for ELLs, perhaps um, the most critical case, which occurred recently at the US Supreme Court in 2009, is a case called Horn versus Flores. So although the Supreme Court ruled on this in 2009, this case goes back decades. Um, it goes back to a group of students in Nogales, Arizona, who filed suit against the state, alleging both violations of the Equal Educational Opportunities Act and that the state failed to take appropriate action for ELLs by providing inadequate funding for programs and instruction. So the Supreme, um, Arizona Supreme Court initially, um, sorry, um, the US Supreme Court ruled in favor of the state of Arizona, arguing that the state made significant effort. There had initially been rulings in favor of the plaintiffs um, allowing for more funding, but the ultimate decision was by the US Supreme Court so they ruled in favor of the state. Um, Justice Samuel Alito states the following four reasons in his decision. First, Arizona impl implemented a new structured English immersion program. So structured English immersion is when ELLs are pulled out, placed in English only classrooms for the majority of the day and forbidden from using their native language throughout the day. So, it's essentially an all day ESL course. I'm simplifying, but that's the basic description. Second, he alleged that No Child Left Behind, now the Every Student Succeeds Act, created more accountability for schools and that there was no evidence that increases in funding lead to increase in student achievement. There's more rigorous evidence now showing that money does indeed matter and does increase student outcomes and achievement. 
but this was an allegation with very little evidence made by Justice Alito at the time. Third, the Nogales School District had major curricular and management reforms in compliance with EEOA, so they changed leadership and other things. And finally, Arizona had already increased school funding and EEOA does not require any specific level of funding. Alito does not address whether that funding was actually adequate or not, just that it had increased it and that was good enough, kind of. The court didn't apply the Castaneda three-prong test because they viewed that as something that was only a circuit court ruling, therefore had no relevance to a Supreme Court ruling. And the ultimate conclusion of this case is that EEOA could only be used to hold school districts accountable, not states for providing adequate funding. So the responsible parties for providing programs, adequate programs for ELLs were the school districts themselves. So a little um, primer on how school funding works. So school funding at the local level is primarily based on property wealth and taxes. And state aid systems are designed to offset disparities in property wealth. So the problem with that is if you can't hold states accountable, then districts themselves are either gonna have to raise taxes in inequitable ways or find ways to take money from other students and reallocate them to ELLs. So the whole thing becomes highly inequitable and unfair. So the most recent case concerning English language learners is um, ESA versus Lancaster, which was in the Pennsylvania school district. This concerns a special group of English language learners known as students with inter interrupted and limited formal education, SLIFE as the acronym. So these a lot of times are students who come here as refugees, asylees, who attended school at one time, but um, had a break in their formal education and are re-enrolling for a variety of reasons. So the district placed these groups of students in inferior programs because they were overage and undercredited and wanted to kind of push them through and graduate them. So the district offered two programs, an international school program within its neighborhood, which was considered superior, and then um, a kind of alternative school, which provided inferior curriculum. So the plaintiffs sued the district saying that they should be placed in the international school program, which had offered superior methods of instruction and education. The court applied the Castaneda three-prong test and found violations of prongs one and three. So the program that was at the alternative school was not based on sound educational theory. And there was no evidence that the alternative program helped students overcome language barriers. So what we see is um, federal courts are willing to, um, willing to use the Castaneda three-prong test, but only to hold districts accountable. Adequate funding is not a requirement under um, EEOA. So now we're going to get into uh, the second fe pertinent federal policy for English language learners, which is um, the Every Student Succeeds Act, formerly known as No Child Left Behind. Here's a basic overview of the federal definition of ELL. Um, nothing surprising here. They use the term limited English proficient. I'm going to get into um, why different terms are used and the harm that can be caused by using these terms. You'll sometimes hear the term English learner instead of English language learner. So federal requirements for ELLs in terms of assessment. So under the Every Student Succeeds Act of 2015, all states must have standardized statewide procedures for identifying ELLs and for determining when special language services are no longer needed. This process is known as reclassification or reclassifying. ELLs must take annual English language proficiency assessments to assess their skills in reading, writing, listening, and speaking. States must include an indicator in the, their statewide accountability system that measure ELLs annual progress in achieving English language proficiency. In other words, the reclassification rates. States must define what it means to reach English language proficiency as measured by their assessment and establish ambitious, in quotes, long-term goals and measurements of interim progress. Finally, states must also include ELLs in their ELA and math assessments and disaggregate gaps between ELLs and non-ELLs. 
The idea being that by holding districts and schools accountable for the achievement of ELLs, they'll improve, uh, um, they'll reduce achievement gaps and improve achievement for ELLs. Um, that theory has been called into question recently, but nevertheless, it has exposed large gaps between English language learners and non-English language learners. So I talked a little bit earlier about the term English language learners limited English proficient and why those may be harmful. So I'm gonna go a little bit into more why we need to think more about the terminology that we use. So by using the term English language learners, we're framing the fact that they come from a different language and culture as a problem. So in 1984, a linguist and scholar named Richard Ruiz wrote a piece about framing um, language in three different ways. So there is language as an asset, language as a problem, and language as a right. So this kind of tests English proficiency-based view of English language learners frames their native language and culture as a problem, something to be overcome, removed from them, and kind of not valued. Um, there was also an anti-bilingual education backlash and movement in the 1990s. So Arizona, California, and Massachusetts were three exemplars of this, documented well in Patricia Gandara and Megan Hopkins' book, um, Forbidden Language. Um, they document the anti-bilingual ed movements. I believe Massachusetts and California both passed ballot initiatives recently, which made it easier to access bilingual ed. Arizona still has structured English immersion classrooms. So also in her 2009 book, Translating Childhood, Marjorie Oriana um, made the assertion and argument that schools fail, fail to value the work that immigrant children and English language learners do in their schools and communities. Specific, specifically, they serve as language brokers between what happens in the classroom and also um, what happens in their communities. And that schools and assessment frameworks in the current moment fail to value um, what they do and all the work that they do. So more recently, the scholar Ophelia Garcia at the City University of New York has suggested the term emergent bilinguals rather than English language learners. And um, the idea there being that it frames um, students' um, native language and culture as, as an asset rather than a deficit. So all this is to say, I'll be using the term ELL throughout just because that's what's used at the federal level but um, the term emergent bilingual is preferable just to frame things in a different way. And also to frame it in the idea that if we were to build an accountability system that valued bilingualism and multiculturalism, we may have an achievement gap in the opposite direction, showing that students who have a native language and culture different than the dominant one may actually achieve at higher levels. So, overview of identification and reclassification for English language learners. How are ELLs identified and reclassified? What's the basic overview and process? Although each state and district kind of does it slightly differently, this is pretty much what I've seen in most, if not all districts. It all begins with the home language survey. Um, the number of questions varies across states and districts, but they generally ask something like, does your child speak a language other than English at home? What is the dominant language? Um, how fluent is your child in English? Like it, the wording varies um, district by district and state by state. The student answers yes to one or more of the questions on the HLS. They conduct a follow-up interview to ensure that the child and parent answered the HLS correctly. Next, um, an appropriate English language proficiency screener is administered. And if the student scores above the threshold, student is not identified as ELL. Students with scores below the cut score are identified as ELL. Um, parents are notified. ELLs are placed in a program and remain in the program until they score above a cut score on the ELP assessment. And they meet all additional reclassification and criteria, which we're gonna get to in my analysis. So here is a sample of the home language survey the initial instrument used in the identification of ELLs from the Patterson School District in New Jersey. As you can see, New Jersey has 
eight um, different steps, or sorry, nine different steps for identifying ELLs at the initial point. The, this home language survey, from what I've seen in New Jersey, is a little bit more rigorous than what I saw in Chicago, which only asked two questions prior to administering the English language screener. So a little bit more background about ELP screeners and assessments. They generally include reading, writing, listening, and speaking domains. In pre-K and kindergarten, they only include listening and speaking. They also include performance descriptors for each domain and cut scores for identification and reclassification. The scales vary by test um, and the weight also changes for each section by grade level. The upper grades tilting more towards reading and writing, lower grades more towards listening and speaking. So within these ELP screeners and assessments, they've developed what are called testing consortia. So the biggest testing consortia in the United States is known as world-class instructional design and assessment, better known as WIDA. So New Jersey is a WIDA state and of all the, um, the 51 states, including Washington DC, 36 states in the country belong to the WIDA assessment, uh, um, to the WIDA consortia. So within the WIDA consortia, um, the screener is known as um, the WIDA ELP screener and the end of year ELP assessment is known as ACCESS 2.0. So ACCESS has proficiency levels from one to six, one being the lowest, six being the highest for each domain and also an overall score. There's two other consortia that, is, uh, that are prevalent in the US. One is called ELPA 21, English Language Proficiency Assessment for the 21st Century. So that includes states like Oregon and Nebraska, I believe about six or seven total states belong to that consortia. And one more called Lost Links, which includes Connecticut and Mississippi. What's notable is the two states with the largest um, ELL populations, California and Texas, do not belong to any of these consortia. They've developed their own English language proficiency assessments. New York doesn't belong to a consortia as well, nor does Arizona. So now we're going to get into the heart of what this research is, which is we've talked about the federal background for ELLs. What I wanted to dive into more were the state policies and the variation across states of how do state policies vary in their criteria for the identification and reclassification for ELLs and how do state policies vary in their funding for ELLs across the 51 states? So my data sources. So I dove deep into state regulations, state policy handbooks, and state websites to find out more about their procedures and policies for identifying and reclassifying ELLs. And then also the second step, how do they account for ELLs in their state funding formulas? Methods. So for identification re reclassification, the things I looked for were what testing consortia that um, each state belonged to, the screener assessment used, proficiency levels, cut scores, and also additional criteria for identification re reclassification. What I was really interested in was seeing whether each state used things other than a single test score to identify and reclassify ELLs. Um, this only includes grades one through 12, pre-K and kindergarten use different tests, so I excluded them. For funding policies, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each variable in a second, but the variables include funding type, base funding per pupil, pupil weight, dollar amount, teacher allocation, combo weight, and addition on the policy. I'm going to describe each of those components in detail. So my findings on the assessment part. Only 11 states use additional criteria other than a single ELP score to identify and reclassify ELLs. So New Jersey happens to be one of those states. And in New Jersey, they require um, teachers to use additional rubrics along with convene with a panel to dis discuss whether a student should be identified as ELL and also whether a student should be reclassified. These other reclassification criteria include grades, teacher recommendations, portfolios, scores on other assessments in math and ELA, and more. 
some states have created committees to make determinants for it, not dissimilar to the IEP team. Five states use um, criteria, but only for students scoring within a particular band that's below the cut score. So for example, in Georgia, their cut score is 4.8 for access, but if you score between 4.3 and 4.7, they allow for teachers to exercise judgment in determining reclassification. So what this, all of this is to say is that 35 states don't use additional criteria for classification or identification. This means that they're making a high stakes decision based on the results of a single test. So the reason why this matters is that you want to allow multiple pathways to identification and also to ensure that students actually have access to services that they need. If everything is based on a single test score, that could be problematic for that. And also in the secondary level, it means that you're emphasizing English language proficiency more than other criteria, particularly academic development, which is kind of the goal of schooling is to be able to learn across a wide variety of subject areas and to develop proficiency across all subjects. So why this matters is, this is a study from Reardon and Valentino at Stanford. I just wanted to show here that students, particularly ELLs in dual language immersion programs in which they're taught both in English and in their native language have greater learning tra trajectories than students in English immersion programs, which means that an accountability regime based only on English proficiency could be problematic and, um, and could kind of limit students learning trajectories. All right, um, what I really want to get to in more detail is um, the funding policies for ELLs. So I'm going to describe in detail each of the things I look for in state funding policies. So every state offer that has a funding formula offers what's called the base funding per pupil, which is a fixed amount per pupil given for all students to achieve a specified outcome. Now there's more complication to this than what I've stated, like the state adjusts for property wealth in each area and deducts the local fair share and all that. But I'll give a basic example. In New Jersey, under the School Funding Reform Act of 2008, students in New Jersey are supposed to be funded at a base level of 11,775 per pupil. That's the amount given for each pupil with no additional needs. So who a student not in poverty who doesn't qualify for a free or reduced lunch, who has no IEP and also is not an English language learner. Next, I, qualify, I classified each funding type for ELLs as formula funding, categorical, a combo, or not applicable, meaning they don't account for English language learners. So more detail about this coding. Categorical funding means funding that is provided through a line item in the budget and made based on what the legislature is willing to authorize and what the executive branch will approve. So in a sense, that's true for all types of education funding because education funding is authorized by people, by elected officials. So the legis state legislature and the executive branch, you could make the argument that everything is categorical, but in this sense, I use categorical to refer to funding in states that don't have a funding formula. So the example I provide here is that Alabama, the state of Alabama appropriated $7.3 million for English as a second language and budget without a funding formula. That funding is generally distributed based on the population. So on a per pupil basis. The formula funding is where state lays out a specific mathematical funding formula to mathematically calculate how much each district should receive. So there's a number of ways um, states attempt to account for English language learners in their funding formula. First is a pupil weight. A pupil weight is a multiplier used when counting students to distribute funding. A student with no additional needs is counted as 1.0, while a student with additional needs is counted as more than 1.0. So in my example from here is that Connecticut provides a pupil weight of 0.15 for ELLs, meaning that ELLs mean receive 1.15 times more funds per pupil than a student with no additional needs. Another way that states account for ELLs is the flat dollar amount. So it's a fixed dollar amount provided for students 
with additional needs that, that says no ELL. So the example is Michigan provides $900 per ELL at levels 1.0 1. 1. to 1.9, 620 per ELL levels 2.0 to 2.9, and 100 per ELL levels 3.0 to 3.9. Other ways that um, states account for ELL needs. Teacher allocation, which means that they give a recommended class size and then allocate and pay for teacher positions based on the statewide salary. So example, Virginia provides 20 teachers per 1,000 ELLs, in addition to whatever teachers they pay for based on class sizes ranging from 20 to 1 to 30 to 1. Some states also provide what's called a combo weight, meaning that if a student is, for example, eligible for free or reduced lunch and also eligible as an English language learner, they only get the funding for being eligible for free or reduced lunch, meaning they don't get the multiplier across multiple categories. This can be problematic in diluting the levels of funding for ELLs. Finally, what I did as a cal basic calculation was taking the per um, calculating the per pupil yield, which took the base amount to a pupil and either multiplied it by the weight or added the ELL flat dollars per pupil. So my findings, so 40 states include ELLs in some way in their funding formulas, which in theory seems positive. But what I wanna emphasize here is that just having a funding formula doesn't mean you're actually going to provide adequate funding. So categorical funding can also work if you're actually providing sufficient funding. Just like I'll emphasize as well, just having a pupil weight doesn't mean that the weight is derived in any way that's meaningful or adequate. Six weights, uh, six states provide funding for ELLs through categorical line items. Three use a combo approach. So um, Colorado has a weird approach where they have categor a categorical program and an act that authorizes funding for English language learners and then also include them in their funding formula in limited ways. Nevada has something called the Zoom Schools Program, which is a competitive grant program that schools can apply for for providing programs for ELLs. So they kind of take a hybrid approach. Two states don't list funding for ELLs. So in the states that do provide funding for ELLs in their formula, 27 states use pupil weights, Four use a combo weight that dilute funding for ELLs. Seven use flat dollar amounts per pupil. Six use teacher allocations based on prescribed class size and teacher student ratios. And five states provide tiered funding. So tiered funding meaning more funding provided to ELLs at lower English language proficiency levels and less funding provided to ELLs at higher English language proficiency levels. Categorical programs generally were distributed per pupil, but they also included competitive grants and other programs with limited eligibility for schools. So I wanted to guide, provide you guys with more detail with on how I compared states. So I picked three WIDA states with kind of different um, requirements and different base funding per pupil. As you can see, these three states, New Jersey, Florida, and Michigan, have different cut scores and different ELL populations. All three use a formula. So New Jersey and Florida use pupil weights, while Michigan uses a flat dollar amount per pupil. And what I did was I took their base funding per pupil, multiplied it by the pupil weight to get an ELL per pupil yield. So as you can see, New Jersey's per pupil amount is significantly larger than Florida and Michigan. However, without adjusting that raw number for the cost of living or a comparable wage for teachers in each area, it becomes hard to compare that. That is actually gonna be part of my next analysis, which attempts to adjust for all relevant factors in that. Another thing you'll notice is the weight for ELLs is a lot higher in New Jersey than it is for Florida. However, New Jersey has that combo weight. So what does this mean in making comparisons across states? So I finally wanted to look at whether there was any relationship between ELL concentrations within states and a per pupil yield. And what we can see is there is no systematic relationship between that that the percent ELL con concentration explains 
not even 1% of the variance in per pupil yield, funding per pupil. And you can see that line is flat, meaning that states really are not truly accounting for English language learners in their funding formulas in a meaningful way, that they're not providing sufficient pupil weights, sufficient dollar amounts per pupil, or I couldn't do the analysis for teacher allocations just because there isn't a base amount per pupil, but for the 32 states that use fixed dollar amounts or pupil weights, that they need to address the needs of ELLs in a greater and more sufficient way. Um, so what this equation is telling us is that a 10% increase in um, ELL population is associated with the $273 increase in per pupil funding. However, that funding is really not statistically significant. So again, this means that states are not doing enough to meet the needs of districts serving greater concentrations of ELLs. Conclusions. Majority of states identify and reclassify ELLs based on a single test score. Current accountability systems heavily emphasize English proficiency. States cannot be held responsible under EEOA for providing adequate funding for ELLs. Only districts are responsible. Little to no relationship between a state's ELO concentration and funding for a pupil. And also weighted funding by itself doesn't yield adequate funding because adequacy requires both an adequate base funding per pupil and an adequate weight. So now we're going to get in, uh, we're gonna conclude with possible causes of inadequate funding. The combo weights, which I discussed earlier, states creating restrictions on funding for districts requiring specific thresholds, overall insufficient effort, effort being a measure of education spending compared to gross state product or gross domestic product, so using the report from our school finance database indicators, a number of states fail to exert sufficient effort on that. Inadequate weights, policies that promote the stealth inequalities of school funding. So property tax giveaways, um, taking school funding and distributing it based on attendance, um, hold harmless provisions. There's a whole paper on this that Bruce Baker wrote in 2012, I believe. And then more recently, um, Bruce introduced the paper about disparities for school districts serving greater concentration of Latinx students. Um, because ELLs are primarily Spanish speakers, we can conclude similar findings for that paper and future analyses. So future research, my next papers will involve using real data to examine the relationship between concentration of ELLs and revenues per pupil, and also attempt to calculate um, the pupil weights for ELLs, what should they be, and how much additional funding would districts serving greater concentration of ELLs require for ELLs to meet specific, specific outcomes. I believe that is it. Good timing, AJ. <laughs> All right, um, thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to jump in. I have a question. Um, and first, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, my question is, if you could go back to that graph you showed with um, ELL funding per pupil versus the ELL concentration. Sure, the, sc the scatter um, plot. Right. And could you say what you would expect to see if states were providing adequate funding and why? Because it's not clear to me why those two should be related. Sure. Um, so if states were providing, if there was um, a yield per pupil that um, was associated with the yellow concentration, you would see a sharper sloping line going up, right? And what you see here is a flat line. So if, EL, if ELLs are truly accounted for in state funding formulas, you would see a systematic relationship, meaning as ELL concentration goes up, so would the yield per pupil. I'm, I'm not sure, I, I wanna butt in a little bit on that one too. I, I get the question um, that, that's being raised here. 
I, you know, if, if the marginal cost of each additional ELL was the same in low concentration and high concentration settings, you know, we'd at least like to see a flat line of, of dots that was somewhere near the per pupil cost of serving them. I think the main thing you get from this is that states are all over the place, right? I, in fact, you may find that as your ELL concentration increases that the marginal cost of serving, of meeting their needs decreases. And it might in theory even be rational for that line to slope downward. Um, what's not rational is for the dots to be all over the damn place and not tied to anything, <laughs> right? Um, so that's yeah, thank you. a little kind of pushback. I, I, I looked at that too, I said, well, you know, we don't know if your costs are going, but that's also, that's actually part three of AJ's dissertation is to try to figure out how the costs vary um, under different circumstances. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. That makes sense. Can I ask Christian, what, what, what area, what's your area of study? Oh, I'm, I'm studying math education. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. Anyone else? Question? Okay, uh, going once. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so, AJ, thank you for, for your work. It is essential, critical, and timely, especially in light of COVID. How do you project that this will impact funding for ELLs as we move forward, pandemic learning specifically? And, and what do you potentially suggest as ways that we can advocate for better funding, those of us that are teachers in the field or scholars? So sure, so I think going into this research, my number one goal was looking at like when state tells you that they provide weighted funding for, e for ELLs, what, what does that mean? Like, how are they getting these weights? Like, what is their approach to doing it? And is it derived in a sound way? So even if you, um, as Bruce has described, a, a, um, use a bottom-up or a top-down approach, bottom-up meaning you work from the suggestions of educators and build towards specific resources, class sizes and things like that, or top down meaning you build a cost function. Is it targeted towards achieving a specific outcome? So are, are you reasonably calculating it to achieve that outcome? And then also thinking more about what are the outcome goals that, and standards that we want ELs to meet, right? So I think kind of bringing those two pieces together and then deriving adequacy costs and kind of ensuring that states are held accountable for meeting that, those funding goals. And, and you use the phrase reasonably, reasonably calculated for a purpose, and that is? So reasonably calculated, meaning that they're mapped to a specific outcome standard that it's not just an arbitrary amount given. Right. And that language is drawn from Castaneda, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Trying to decide whether I should poke at him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'll let him off the hook. Isn't He's, that uh, what the nice dissertation job. defense is for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll no, that's actually what all the lead up to the defense is True. for. <laughs> so the, the defense is just smooth sailing. Right, right, right. <laughs> Okay, um, well, let me, so let me see if I just see a chat. Let me just check it. Oh, just some thanks to, eat, to AJ. Okay, um, well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, AJ, for 
your presentation and um, hopefully we'll see you next week. I see a hand raised, Brittany. No, that's a applause. Oh, it's applause. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I don't. Yeah, nice. yeah oh, the applause. little lines. Okay. Yeah. I got to look yeah, for yeah. the applause uh, thing. Right. right. <laughs> well done. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.